morning everybody and welcome to a dull September morning here in the UK and today I'm looking at this S3 2000 edition Nikon rangefinder camera the original S3 came out in 1958 and for the year 2000 Nikon produced this model which is basically identical to the original 1958 S3 and they made about 8,000 of these cameras and it's actually cost them more money to make them than what they sold them for. Uh, I think they sold for about $6,000 for the camera body and um, most of them went to collectors rather than actual users uh, people thinking that they could sell them in the future and uh, make more money on them but you can actually buy them for uh, I would say less than a thousand pound today uh, so they've actually lost value at the moment but I'm sure in the future they will increase in value so it's basically an exact replica of the original 1958 S3 some very slight changes just so you can recognize yourself uh, the difference um, one is the serial number it actually says S3 at the beginning and all these begin with a serial number of 2-0 other slight changes uh, they made to the film counter uh, which you can select 36 and 24 originally it would be 20 and 36 and made other very slight changes um, I think the other one that's quite obvious is the printing on the bottom of the film speed reminder uh, it's now says ISO instead of ASA and I say again there's other changes which are quite insignificant I'm sure there's other changes in, internally as well <clears throat> but they did try and make it exactly the same in use so I'm just going to run through its controls and features and uh, many of you subscribe to my channel will know that I uh, had originally a S2 rangefinder camera which I've now sold and I purchased this one this came from Japan, I say most of them or all of them were sold in Japan they were made for the uh, export market but a lot of them have got into a lot of hands so just go over the control, this one is more similar to the Nikon F top plate uh, in fact it's basically identical um, the shutter dial now is a single dial, on this two it was a, like a double layer affair and you've got shutter speed ranges from one second all the way up to one thousandth of a second and you've also got a T mode for timed and B for bulbed. You've got your shutter advance lever, uh, which obviously winds on the film as well and cocks the shutter. And you know the shutter is cocked on these, by the way. You've got a little, you can see a little black dot in the centre of the shutter dial. And if that's pointing to the arrow of the index, then you know the shutter is cocked. You see when I fire it, with the shutter release button that button moves offset so that's one way to know if, you, if your shutter is cocked on these um, see there's also a little red dot on the button which spins as well and uh, that was used for a very simple multiple exposure uh, way of creating multiple exposures around the shutter button is the setting for advance which is the normal mode for when you're taking pictures so you set the little black dot to the A and you've also got a R for when you get to the end of the film you want to rewind you just set the lift it up the collar move it over to the R and that releases the sprocket inside so you can rewind the film um, you don't actually have to lift the collar up sorry you just turn it across one way or the other <clears throat> in the front of the shutter dial you've got a flash mode indicator 
Uh, it's currently set on FX, which stands for electronic flash. If you lift the collar of the shutter speed dial and rotate it, you can set different settings for different types of flashes, like ball flashes, etc. And these were uh, mentioned in the a manual, which I don't have for this, but I'm sure it's pretty similar to the S2 one. Here is the frame counter, and it doesn't actually reset on this one. On the S2, you have to do it manually, but this one resets to zero when you open the back. And say so this is just basically a reminder to tell you how many frames are on the actual film itself. So when you see the counter go up, you know, roughly uh, when you're near the end of the film. Got the hot shoe plate, but it's not a hot shoe, it's a, basically a code shoe for fitting a flash or other accessories like a finder or a meter. And you've got the name Nippon Kokugu Tokyo. You've got the rewind crank and lever for rewinding the film and tensioning the film. And beautifully made cameras, you can see it's all metal nice heavy feel to it but it feels lovely in the hand because it's very small and compact compared to obviously a um, SLR camera or obviously compared to a digital camera today. Looking at the back, <clears throat> very little on the back except for the viewfinder of course which is the most important thing and on the S3, on the S2 it was just a, a 50 millimeter a viewfinder on the S3, they've put multiple grid lines. I don't know if you can just quite catch that. If you're catching the light, you can just see there's different squares, <clears throat> and they are different framing guides for the outer one is for 35 millimeter, then a 50 millimeter, and the innermost one is for a 105 millimeter lens. So when you look through, it can seem a little bit cluttered because you see all those frame lines at the same time. On the SP, that is something <clears throat> they I'm improved on, but they made it better, but it obviously cost more money. The SP has a, a more advanced viewfinder where the frames change when you change the um, setting on the, I think it's on the film rewind crank, there's a setting around that, for setting the different frame guides. Uh, to remove the back, it's just like a, an earlier S2 or a Nikon F camera. You use this lock lever here, you just flick up the catch and turn it to open and that would just be frame counter your ear twirling. You can pull off the back, got the pressure plate on the back. Uh, another thing that's different on these, the earlier S3 958 version had patent numbers on the back. Uh, this hasn't, so that's one way you can tell if this has been exchanged with a, another earlier model. Got a tripod socket on the bottom, got where you put the film in, you can insert the cassette uh, from the bottom of course, pull the leader across and insert it into one of the sprocket, uh, uh, the holes in the, in the sp spool and advance it and you can see the shutter kit which is cloth and just make sure the film's engaged on these sprockets here. You take it to the first frame and then you can put the back back on. This is a film I've just actually used the last few shots of this film this morning. Just doing some test shots uh, because it's the first roll of film I've had through this camera. So I've been testing the fast shutter speeds uh, at 1000th of a second and I've just recently tested the 1 second shutter speed. Uh, to see obviously if the camera's working as it should, but uh, hopefully it should be. Um, that's the shutter firing, as you can see that's in T mode actually, so you can see through the lens there. Uh, and in T mode the shutter remains open until you turn it to a different setting. Just put the back back on. Now I've got a original 50mm f1.4 Nikon rangefinder lens fitted. Uh, it was released this version 
with an updated multi-coated lens which I would imagine is superior as regards quality wise but these are meant to be really tack sharp um, the mount is obviously completely different to a Nikon F mount and you release the lens with this little catch here you just push in this little spring catch and then you can turn and release the lens and it just turns so the red dot lines up that index there you can pull the lens off that's 50 millimeter lens and looking at the mount uh, you should always obviously um, I've got to mention have the lens set to infinity when you're mounting and unmounting the lens and if you look at the, the mount itself you've got an inner mount for the 50 mil lens which obviously corresponds then with these scalings on the outside of this ring you've got these in meters and that is another difference actually the original one had feet as well so you've got a scaling here, the focusing scale, and you've got the, I don't know if you can see, you've got the aperture setting showing so you could judge the depth of field. So that's the inner mount for this lens. Now there's also a outer mount. You can just see these prongs here sticking out. And that's if you fit something like a 35mm lens, it will actually fit on the outer edge of the mount. Uh, rather than the inner one and that's obviously because these scalings then are completely useless for that particular lens and obviously then through the viewfinder you would use the outermost uh, framing guide for the 35mm uh, say on S2 you always add a 50mm view so you would need to put a, a different find on top so you could uh, get the right reference for that Put the lens back on and you just align the red dot, that red dot, and just turn it and you see it just clicks on that little spring. Now the focusing, uh, when it's set to infinity you have to release it with this little lever here. There's a wheel, a focusing wheel, and a little lever that you press, but you can actually catch it as you're turning it anyway, so it's not, it's not difficult to do. So you just push down on that and then it releases the lock on the lens and then you can focus either by the wheel or by the lens itself it doesn't make any difference but they do say if you fit a different lens that fits on the outer mount like a 35mm or a 105mm you should focus via the lens itself um, just looking from the front you can see the rangefinder window and the view Finder and it's say it's similar to the S2 where the viewfinder, uh, the rangefinder window, sorry, puts a square, like an orange square dot in the centre that you focus in, and when the two images become aligned, that's when you know the image is in focus. Here you've got a self timer, and you just flick that to set it, and you then Got the shutter, you fire the shutter or set the self timer going, I should say, by pressing this little button here, which starts the self timer and when it gets up near the top, it will fire the shutter. Now, the shutter on this is very, very quiet, um, it's seemingly quiet, so it's say something like a sixth of a second, and you listen. Very quiet, in fact, it, it sounds it makes me think, is the shutter actually firing? But obviously, if you look at it, it does. Uh, one second, set in. Yeah, nice clockwork sound, which I love. So, the other thing to show you, I'd say the very simple cameras actually, uh, but beautifully made. And um, the other thing you would need with something like this is a meter. And I was lucky when I went to Japan recently, I obtained this uh, original meter which only fits on the S3, the SP, I think the S4 as well, I can't be 100% sure but I would imagine it, it does. So this is a Nikon original light meter for these cameras 
and the meter is virtually only useful on these cameras uh, and I'll show you how you fit it and this one is accurate, it does work, the needle works and it's quite accurate actually I, I presume it, it seems to measure right with my digital camera I'll just put a little piece of sticky tape on the front there because there's a little slot there uh, because you can use it for reading incident light in other words reflected, sorry not reflected light, incident light which is direct light onto your subject that way or normally when it's on the camera uh, you flick up the front exposing all the CDS cells and you would then be reading obviously reflected light from the subject uh, so I just cover that up so when I've got it closed it's not using the cells at all because uh, the cells do wear over time as such because there's no battery involved it's just uh, the cell itself that causes the needle to move up and you see if, if I point it towards the light here's the actual needle which um, obviously as the light goes down the needle moves accordingly and the way you would use this on this camera so it fits on the shoe and a bit tricky to insert actually what I do is say set the camera to 60th of a second shutter speed and then go to fit the and you uh, go to fit the meter you fit it from the front backwards and first of all you have to get the front bit started like so and then once you're at that stage what I do then is set the dial on top to 60 of a second against this pointer there and then there's like a little spring action uh, you can see the actual wheel there that makes contact with the shutter dial so it actually turns at the same time but obviously to bypass that when you're putting it on you press against the spring and push the meter all the way back and then release it and if you've done it right you should have the shutter speed on the dial and the shutter speed showing on the meter the same so now when I turn the shutter dial there you go so you've got 30 for a second 15th and it matches up with what's showing on the actual camera so to do a light reading um, so it's quite dark in here but I'll try and point it towards something so we'll get a nice reading so if I want 60th for a second set the shutter to 60th of a second point towards your light and looking at the meter here uh, that's showing between 2.8 and f4 so that is what you would set on the lens on the front here you've got the aperture setting and you just turn that until it says 2.8 to 4 you can set the aperture in between so you could get it exact and you've got the camera set up so you can then take your shot so that's a nice thing as well. I've also got a booster for it which fits on the side so you can use it in in lower light but uh, I'll not show you that now. Um, so I'll just remove that to show you the, the wheel. So again when you remove it you have to press against the spring and pull it. Sorry you have to release that first as well. Pull the meter forward and you can see that's the wheel on the meter that engages with the nailed edge of the shutter dial. So you go, let's look at the Nikon S3, that's the 2000 limited edition. Uh, very nice camera to use, it's very strange to use actually when you're using it for something like um, taking photos of the grandchildren etc. Uh, I find it a bit difficult because using a rangefinder focusing and then you've got to the metering as well um, just makes it so it's difficult to get your shots in focus when the when the moving subjects uh, say it's more useful for uh, portrait landscape photography or general photography you can pre-focus of course using the scaling on the lens uh, set up an eye aperture like f8 f11 and use the scaling here to pre-focus 
and then you can just take the shot. And again, the metering isn't that difficult actually because if the light doesn't change, you don't need to change the meter. Uh, it's a fixed ASA as such. Uh, there's no auto ISA, a, ISOs, so you can basically set a, a shutter speed of say one two fifths of a second at f8 uh, outside. I'm talking obviously uh, if that's what the light measures, and then you can leave it like that until the light changes. Uh, so you don't always have to mess about with that. So there you go, let's look at the Nikon S3 rangefinder. Very nice camera to look at, as you can see. It functions beautifully, it feels beautiful. Uh, and if you can get one, you can get one with the meter. Um, good luck with that, because these are like uh, rocking horse poo. Hope to catch you again soon. I hope you've enjoyed this one. See you later.